Well, this month, uh, we've been looking at a series, The Heart of Christianity, um, past doing all the right things, because I think sometimes when we talk about Christianity, we make it a, a thing about all the, all the do lists, right? All the things that you have to do to be good enough or to be accepted by God or whatever, you know? If, if you're a good enough person, if you dress right, if you talk right, then you'll be accepted by God. And, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on that. If you want to be a Christian, don't lie, don't cheat. Don't do this, don't do that. But Christianity is a lot more than that. And so we've been looking at that this, this, this month. And this is, this is the most difficult series I have ever <laughs> had to preach. Uh, the, the first week we were looking at our attitude towards non-Christians. That was a very difficult sermon to preach. Uh, last week we looked at our attitude towards our sin. We looked at the seven, seven things specifically says that God hates. Another very difficult uh, message, and then today uh, we're looking at uh, true religion, and the basic idea is our attitude towards ministry and towards good works, uh, which is going to be, you guessed it, another difficult message to give. I think next week is probably, well, no, next week is kind of difficult too, but thank goodness next month, <laughs> next month it's a, it's, a, it's a lot easier of, of a sermon a sermons to give next month, uh, so we just have to get through two more. <laughs> Uh, you know, but anyways, really the heart of Christianity is, is the heart. It's not so much, well, it is what you do, but it's not just what you do. It's much more than that. It's, it's, it's how you do things, right? It's, it's how you talk to people. Your witness when you're talking, if you're chewing people out, you're not really being a witness. You know, if you're ripping people off, you're not really being a witness. You know, it's, it's, it's really the heart of how you do things. Uh, when I when I was when I was a kid, I, I played piano, and I think I think played piano is probably a little bit of an over exaggeration. I took piano lessons when I was a kid. Uh, my mom always wanted to be able to play piano, and so that meant that I needed, for some reason, <laughs> to learn how to play piano. And uh, I, I hated it, um, and I was not good at it. So those two things kind of just I think reinforced one another. And, uh, you know, so I, I begged mom. I said, please, 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 can I stop this? No, you need to stick with it. And I said, but I didn't, I never asked to learn the piano, though. Well, you need to stick with it. <laughs> so the years went by. Finally, we move uh, from California to New Mexico. And I'm able to talk mom out of me having to practice because it's too much of a hassle to find a cheap piano teacher. I mean, for real. Uh, we, we got lucky. <laughs> we got lucky in California. Uh, there was this older woman who was a professional that was just retired and didn't have anything to do with her time. So she gave really cheap piano lessons. So here we are in, in Edgewood, New Mexico, which is about 30 or so minutes from Albuquerque. No piano teachers there. <laughs> so huzzah, <laughs> we got a free pass. And I was able to finally talk her out of it. Well, then I decided that I wanted to learn how to play the guitar. So I said, Mom, can I learn how to play the guitar? And she says, I don't know, you, you didn't stick with the piano. You gave up. I said, I didn't ever want to learn the piano. <laughs> You signed me up for that. And uh, so she says, oh, I don't know. I'll think about it. So uh, my birthday comes around. I'm, I'm turning 13. And uh, <laughs> so they do, they give me some gifts that, that are the typical gifts that you would give someone if you have something else that you're going to give them, but you don't want them to know you have something else. So I'm like, okay, this is nice, whatever. You know, we're getting ready to go to the zoo. Dad's getting his shoes on. He says, hey, can you go get my shoes from the, uh, from the closet? So I go, and I open up the door, and there's a, a new guitar just for me. I'm so excited. We start lessons in January, and I'm, I'm all excited. I'm going for it. And I did fantastic on the guitar. I just picked it up like that. It was like a native language. You know what I mean? When you pick something that's just so natural to you that you don't even... You just, you don't even have to have somebody say, you need to go do that. It's just part of you. For some, maybe you write poetry, which I don't understand how you could master the English language enough to write poetry, but if you do, huzzah. <laughs> uh, some people may be art or whatever, but for me, it was the guitar. And I got really, really good, had great skill, but when I played, I didn't play with feeling. It, w it didn't have any heart to it. So I could play technical things that sounded good, but it just was a little bit lacking. And my siblings uh, would complain to me. They would say, you know, uh, you, you, you just you don't have any feeling. You don't, you don't play with any heart. And uh, so I, I, I started learning classical music, and I was able to eventually figure that out. But there's a form of religion. There's a form of faith that looks good, but it's really only skin deep. It's just like me with a guitar. It, it sounded good, 
but it lacked heart. And this is exactly what saying in Timothy 3, 5 says when it says, holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. It looks good, but it just doesn't have much depth to it. And that's really what we're going to be looking at in James chapter 1, verse 26 through 27. It says this, If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless. And not only is it useless, but he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So let's kind of Let's kind of look at this. Uh, the first part of the verse, if anyone thinks he is religious, it's interesting because most of your modern translations are going to say something like this. If, this. if a person thinks he is religious, something where you are thinking about yourself. But it could also be translated in another way, and I believe the only translation that I know of that says it this way is the King James. Uh, and it says, if anyone seems to be religious. The way that the Greek is written here, it really could be translated either way. And, uh, but either way, the idea here is something that is, it, it, it's talking about the appearance here. You might look good to yourself or to others, or you might look and do the right things. Okay, but then it says, if anyone among you seem to be religious, what does that, what's the idea there? Well, religious, you could say religious in, in this context is, is the outward form of our faith. It is how our faith works itself out. Richardson wrote this. He said, it is the external observ observable qualities. Or uh, BDAG, if you're a scholar, says it, is, it defines it as the expression of devotion. So some examples that Mounts gave, uh, I'll mention them right here. Religious could be summarized with a couple different examples. Uh, you have going to church. That would be an expression of your faith. You have singing and clapping. That would be an expression of your faith. Uh, you have volunteering or, or leading in something. Those are all good examples of religious. These are the things that it's not necessarily on your heart, but it's something that ho it could be an expression of what's on your heart or it could be a fake. Either way, um, either way, it's the same word that would kind of clarify for both of those. So if anyone is, uh, thinks that they're religious... Let's start at the beginning then. Um, where is it? Sorry, I'm missing my line. There it is. Uh, if anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, and that takes us to the next, to the next idea, uh, controlling his tongue. Well, in the immediate context, controlling his tongue is more, um, is more an angry rant. Like when you get mad at your kid and you shoot off your mouth, <laughs> when you get out mad at your spouse and you guys get in a fight, <laughs> when you're at work and things kind of maybe get a little bit tense, an angry kind of when you're talking politics, you know it's a you know it's a it's a voting year, uh, an election year, right? Ooh, boy, we, uh, when you're talking politics and things maybe get a little bit, uh, um, you know, <laughs> uh, vocal, I guess you could say. And if you back up just a few verses to verse 19, it says, "My dear brothers and sisters, understand this: everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger." For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. However, controlling your tongue goes beyond just the anger of ants. It can also extend to slander. If you turn, for instance, to 1 Corinthians 6.10, it says, No thieves or greedy people or drunkards or verbally abusive people, other translations will read slanderers, slanderers, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. Uh, so this is obviously kind of a big deal to God if, if it's something that can exclude you from the blessings. Uh, but uh, controlling your tongue goes beyond that. It can go to gossip, talking about someone who's not there to defend themselves. Um, it's, it's easy, especially in the context of a church, especially in the context of a small church, for everybody to kind of get pick sides in every conflict. You know what I mean? You know what I mean. And it's one of those things where um, it, it, that is a lack of control on your tongue. Uh, so then uh, maybe another example of controlling your tongue, tongue could be um, complaining. Uh, whether you're complaining about a person or a situation, never forget that the Israelites, when they were in the wilderness, one of their big, huge sins that they did that cost them the promised land was they were complaining. It's kind of big. We think of these big sins, right? Like, well, I, I didn't, you know, go online and look at anything. I didn't cheat on my wife. I didn't, you know, I'm a good hard worker. These are the things that we kind of see as, hey, I'm doing all right. But the thing that kept them from the promise was complaining. 
not being thankful. It's really quite an amazing thing. A lack of control of our tongue. So you get, let, let's look at the verse now well, and kind of weigh the score so far. If anyone thinks he is religious, or if you think of someone as being religious, if they seem to be religious, but they don't control their tongue, their religion is useless. So then we get to the next word here, useless. It's a very important word. Um, I'm going to give you a couple different uh, definitions from BDAG, but there's going to be the last one that's going to be on the screen. Useless can be translated as worthless. Your faith is worthless. Um, it could be translated as idle. It could be translated as fruitless. And the last one is the one that we're going to put on the screen. It could be translated as lacking truth. That's the idea behind the word. Your, religious, your religion lacks truth if you don't control your tongue. It's an amazing concept. Like it's Just the idea behind it. It's really not um, something you think about too much. So how does, how does not controlling your tongue make your religion useless? Well, there's two specific ways I want to mention. The first one is when you have a lack of control on your tongue, it ruins your witness. It ruins your witness. And I'll give you a story that I, I've told before, but it's one that always sticks out to me and I think is worth telling again. There was this woman who really caused a lot of problems to every church she went to. She would go to a church for about three or four years and go to another one, for three, and she kept having the same problem. Well, the, the pastor's not religious enough, and this person's not this, and this person's this. The whole time, she's going from person to person complaining, gossiping about everybody. She's never satisfied. Really just a disgruntled person, always finding some way to get out of authorities. Uh, position over her, just some way to do what she wants and have nobody correct her for it. Um, really just kept shooting herself in the, in the foot. And then she kept asking, trying to get her son to go to church. And I, why, why won't you go to church? This bitter woman, very, if you were a man, she hated you. <laughs> That's just how it was. Uh, constant gossip, constant, constant complaining. And she tried to get her son to go to church and her son said, why would I go to church? There's just a bunch of people like you there. See, her witness was shot. She wanted her son to change. She wanted her son to get saved. She wanted her son to go to church, but she didn't want to let God change her. So she went from relationship to relationship, church to church, never being happy because she didn't want to change, but she wanted everybody else to change. So then when she tries to witness to her son, no good, no good. I mean, you can't leave that kind of a legacy and then expect people to want to follow. So the first thing, uh, way it may, an uncontrolled mouth uh, ruins your, makes your religion useless, is it ruins your witness. And the second way that I want to point out, and this is something that Mount, Mount once wrote in, a, in a, one of his blogs, gossip invalidates whatever you do. Whatever good things you do for the kingdom, if you do it with an uncontrolled tongue, it invalidates the blessings that you would have had. It, in, it, it invalidates. And you, well, look what all I've sacrificed, but if you sacrifice it with your mouth open, it counts for nothing. Your religion, your good works are, in other words, insignificant. I remember there was a time when uh, there was this person that had been cleaning the church, and just because of some situations that came up, they were unable to continue. So I stepped in to start cleaning, you know, and, and you know, look at what I'm doing to help the pastor. Look at what I'm doing to, clean, to help the church. So I, I'm, I'm cleaning, and I feel pretty good about myself because I've sacrificed something for the church. And uh, it got to be a thing where every single time that I was doing it, I was just complaining about the pastor and complaining about the church the entire time. Well, if the pastor wouldn't have done it like this, then I wouldn't have to clean this. And if these people would just clean up their own messes, then I wouldn't have to... What good was it that I was cleaning when it was met with that kind of an attitude? And that is the heart of Christianity right there. The heart of Christianity is not doing all the things right. The heart of Christianity is the heart. See, it didn't really matter that I was cleaning the church because I was doing it in a blemished way. And Leviticus tells us not to offer a sacrifice with a blemish. And I was offering with a blemish of my, my heart. I was being prideful. I was being stubborn, and I was being rebellious. And so the good that I was doing counted for nothing because my heart wasn't good. My heart wasn't good. So it says in, in, in James, we're, we're going back to it again, if anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless, 
And the second part of that, he deceives himself. Deceives himself. So think about this. If somebody knew they were deceived, they wouldn't really be deceived, would they? The very definition of deceived means you don't know that you're deceived. We watched a, a, a documentary on Jonestown on Wednesday nights, uh, our, our Wednesday night service, and one of the things you see is that the people didn't get that they were in a cult. And in fact, one of the per- people even said this. She said, nobody ever joins a cult. You, you, don't, you don't go into it thinking you're joining a cult. You think you're joining a movement or you're making a difference or you, know, you have this enlightenment that somebody else doesn't have. You don't really join a cult. So it's the person who, who's doing this, they're shooting off their mouth, but they think that they're religious, they're deceived. They don't understand. They may look the part, but three different problems. First off, they're not right, they're not right with God because if they were right with God, there would be some control there. God gives us a spirit of control. He doesn't give us a chaotic spirit of lack of control. When you see people interrupt a service and stop a, stop a pastor so that they can get up and stand on the stage and give a word from God, that's not a word from God. Because God does not act in chaos. He doesn't do that. In fact, 1 Corinthians says that God is a God of order. He doesn't give us a spirit of confusion, of chaos. He doesn't do that. So, they're not right with God. Second off, they're robbed of a blessing when you when you when you when you're dis, when you're to get to this point of being deceived. It looks the part, but you're robbing yourself of a blessing. And the third off, you're being blinded and misled to where the decisions that you make, either in ministry or in your life, they're going to be skewed because of your attitude. So that brings us to a couple interesting questions that we all have to have to stop and think about for just a minute. Can you be convinced that you are right with God but actually not be? Yes. That's what James just said. They are deceived. You can think you are right with God but not be right with God and be completely oblivious to the fact that you are under God's wrath and judgment. Why? Because of an uncontrolled tongue. Next question that is interesting Sorry, my computer's like, you can't do that. Yes, I can, computer. Uh, The next question that's worth asking, is it a sign that you were never saved? Because surely if you were saved in the first place, you wouldn't have done, no, no. It's a sin that you got tangled in. Hebrews warns us, it says, be careful that the root of bitterness doesn't entangle you and spring up. It's something that, it doesn't mean that you were never saved, because this is what we do. I'm a Christian. I know I'm saved, so I could never get involved with that. Well, that's not what the Bible says, though. Okay, yes, you can be a Christian and get entangled in sin. Have you ever tried to squeeze past those real nasty mesquite bushes we got? They got the real big thorns on it. Have you tried to squeeze past them? Did it work? No, it didn't. Uh, no matter how hard you try, how limber you are, they still seem to snag on your clothes. And that's a lot like what the sin does to us. Not controlling your tongue literally hurts your faith. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm just clearing. I'm just clearing the air. I'm just you know getting things off my chest. No, you're hurting your faith. When your tongue is uncontrolled, your faith gets hurt. Everybody wants to talk about different sins, you know, in the world and stuff. But then when it comes time to okay, but God changed me, then it becomes a different conversation. There are some sins that are acceptable in the context of the church. Gossip is one of them. But in the context of the world, even the world knows that that's not something you should, you should do lest it tear people apart. And Proverbs gives us a lot of warnings about, about that kind of stuff. And I will say that when you allow yourself to go through a sin like this and you give yourself excuses, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. This is what happens. You will go through more times of doubt in your faith And you will also go through more times of trial in your faith if you do not learn to face the sin in your heart. This is why last week, we didn't even go to prayer last week. This is what we said. We said, okay, this week, we're going to spend the entire week, and we're going to pray and ask God, show me which way in me is unpleasing God. Remember? That was, that was, that was the end game. Now, if you did that, I believe that God genuinely would have spoken to your heart and shown you something. Because I know that I'm not perfect. 
And I know God showed me some things this week, and I got a little bit ornery about it. And I thought, well, no, it's okay if I do that. It's not, they are the ones who need to change. Well, what's the good of praying to God for him to show you what's in your heart if you're not going to listen when he answers you? I mean, goodness sakes. And, I mean, we all do that, so it's not like it's, you know, some big secret. But uh, be careful and be aware of it. it it's, not, it, it, it's not something you can change when trying to run from the sin in your heart. Everybody does that. But it's important that you realize what you're doing and that you come back and get yourself right with God. Now, in the book of James, James is really a book of, of contrast is really what it is. If you read through it, it won't be a big surprise to you. You have a lot of these contrasting things. And I've made a little diagram, not diagram, but a little chart uh, to help. Um, in the book of James, he contrasts, contrasts the person who has faith without works with the person that has works that, are sh- that show their faith. Because if you have genuine faith, you will have works. He contrasts the person that hears the word with the person that does the word. He contrasts the person that talks with the person that does. He contrasts in this part we just looked at in verses 26 through 27, someone who looks the part but has a wild tongue with the person who serves the needy with holiness. And so let's kind of look at that. The opposite in, J- in James chapter 1, verse 26 to 27, the opposite of looking the part with a wild tongue is serving the needy with holiness. It's the opposite. It's contrasted in, the, in, this, in this part. So this is a question that I ask myself, and, and I want to invite you guys to, th- to ask yourself this. Is there's no right or wrong answer. It's just something that I want you to think about. Do you talk or are you actively serving the world? I'm not saying do you do favors for people who are in the church, helping those people who are already here. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying is it a part of your regular week to go out of your way to serve Roswell in some way that doesn't get you back where you don't get paid back? Because what happens inevitably, it always happens, the church goes one of two ways. You become good at talking about things or you become good at doing things. There's never a time that I've seen a church in the middle. You're either going to be serving and loving Roswell, which is why we're here. We're here to love God and love people and serve both well. That's our mission. That's why we're here. But if we're only serving ourselves, those already here, and we're talking about things like people or situations, whatever, that's, that's going to be our focus. It can't be both. It's going to be either or. When you let your tongue go wild, it drags you one of two ways. Either you keep letting it go wild and you turn into a self-serving church, or you learn to bridle it and you turn, and turn into a loving, serving church. So we can be a church that talks and sits, or we can be a church that does and grows and loves and serves. But in James, we see that true religion it consists of two things. First off, it consists of serving the needy. Obviously, not only widows and orphans, but it does definitely include widows and orphans. This would be what the world would call social justice. But it's important to make a little bit of a distinction here because we live in a world where people talk a lot about social justice warriors and stuff. And so we need to make a little bit of a distinction between the social justice of the gospel versus the social justice of our culture. Um, the first thing about the social justice of our, cul- of our culture is that it comes from a bad heart. These people are hateful, so we're going to match their hate with their own hate. <sighs> Right? I mean, take, about, take, for instance, the whole Black Lives Matter thing that happened a couple years ago. Okay? This is their message. Black people are important. But is that really what it ended with? No, it went on to violence. Then we were talking about defunding police. And we were talking about, um, you know, getting back at people. I, I have a, well, at the time they were a relative that was walking through the street in Indiana. And a whole Black Lives Matter rally started chasing her to beat her up. I think maybe the message was getting a little bit muddled. You know what I mean? And when our culture does something social justice, it's about getting back at people. It's about getting even. It's not about bringing justice. It's about getting even. The next thing that makes it drastically different from the gospel is that the needs are whatever is seen at the time. See what I mean? It doesn't matter about what is ultimate good. It matters what are we worked up about today. And you know that this is true. I mean, just look at the news. Whether we're talking about Fox or CNN, everybody's upset about something. And they want you to be upset about it too. 
And so now, since I'm upset about it, now it's a social issue. But that's not what the gospel says. Either it's right or wrong, regardless of who's upset about it, regardless of who's not upset about it. And just because everybody around you is upset doesn't make it actually so. Um, well, I think I'll leave that there before I cause unnecessary um, irritation. So the, the third way, I think, that makes the social justice of the culture different from the social justice here being described in, in, in James is that the, the methods are very ineffective. Like, we want to we wanna stand up for people who, who are being mistreated, so we're going to go lay down in, in, a, in a highway. Probably not the, probably not the smartest thing to do. Um, that's where cars drive. I'm not trying to, you know, make fun of any people group, but that's just something that it probably isn't a good idea. But the social justice that, that James 1 is talking about, it comes from a love for God and a love for people. Because I love God... I love people, and therefore I will stand up for the innocent. That's why we stand up against abortion, because babies can't defend themselves. We are not trying to get people to come, become Republican or Democrat, but we are trying to save lives that are being stolen. They can't protect themselves. It's a part of the gospel. The gospel is to stand up for those who can't defend themselves. That's why we're defending the widows and the orphans. And when we go to other countries and when we send missionaries to other countries, we do things like build them wells and stuff. Well, that's good, but it's insignificant all by itself because they'll still die, right? So when we do social justice, we do social justice that points people to God. We do it with a willing heart as a servant. We do it in light of the kingdom. So yes, we will still build their water wells, but we will also tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ for the salvation of the soul. The second part that James 1 tells us about, James 1, 27, is it says, hold on, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and this is the second part, to keep oneself unstained from the world. So the second part then of true religion, the first was serving the needy, the second is uh, to remain unstained. Basically, not acting like the world. We're not gossiping, we're not hating, we're not causing strife, we're at least trying not to. We're not going out and murdering people, or at least we're trying not to. Huh? <laughs> uh, you know, we're not getting involved with those different things. And if you notice, I'm sure you guys have already, um, you probably already got there, but what people tend to do, our natural gear, our natural setting, is to do either or. So you're going to find that people either do social justice or they seek holiness. Wouldn't you say that's true? Either we say, look, I'm supposed to be, apart from this culture, I'm supposed to be holy. And then we stop serving Roswell. We stop serving people because I'm being holy, right? Or we go to the other extreme and say, social justice. We need women's rights and, you know, all this different stuff. And that's what we're all about. And then we never even make it to the gospel. See, it all becomes just a thing about making our culture perfect. And not, it, it's a thing where we're not actually pointing people to God. But in James, he tells us not to do either or. He tells us to do both and. Do social justice and remain unstained. It's both. Now, the world, here's a good example of how this works. The world talks a lot about love, don't they? Love and love and love. And they think that they know. But do you remember during COVID how mean and nasty people got about toilet paper? I remember. Pepperidge Farms remembers too. Uh, I tell you what, uh, things got a little tense there. Uh, you have people who didn't even have babies buying up all the uh, wet ones, and so the rest of us who did have babies were trying to figure out how we're going to wipe their butts. And it was like, well, <laughs> couldn't you have bought just one box, and then I could have bought one box, and everybody, but no, no, no. And that's what I'm talking about. The world talks a big game about love and love and love, but they don't show love. In the church, it has to be different. We can't mirror what they're doing. We have to be better because we have the gospel. They don't. James 2.14 says this. It says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith? I'm religious. I go to church. I'm a good Christian. But does not have works. When you claim to be a Christian, but you are not actively serving, you're not actively doing can such faith save him? 
Now, the Greek is really an interesting language. You can ask questions in such a way in the Greek where it's obvious that it's a rhetorical question by the way that the sentence is structured. English doesn't have that. English has pretty much, if the inflection of my voice hits it, you'll know. Like, for instance, can such faith save him? Well, okay, now that's obvious it's a rhetorical. But if I said it with a different tone, can such faith save him? It asks like I'm genuinely asking, can such faith save him? Well, in Greek, it doesn't have that. Here, in Greek, it's, it's a way where this is a rhetorical question. No, that faith does not save the person. If you claim to be serving God, you claim to love God, but your life doesn't live that out, your faith is dead. It's not, it's not a saving faith. It's not that works save us. It's that a genuinely saved heart produces works. It produces a heart of service. It produces giving your time and your money and, and, your, and your life to something bigger than yourself. It, it, it's something where it, it requires all of you which also includes being able to control your tongue. The church, that talks, the church that talks about one another instead of serving the world is really a club, not a church. Um, and that's a danger I think that we all kind of have to work on. It's something that if the church is not actively pursuing controlling their tongue, it will actively pursue opening their mouth. It's, it's one of those things you have to always be on your guard. And when you think, I have arrived, you're, you're not there. It's one of those things that only when you realize, I really need to get a hold of my tongue, can you really be honest with yourself. Now, this, one of the things that makes this kind of a message hard to give is because you should never, ever, ever talk to somebody else about their sin from a place of, I don't have any sin. And so when I was writing this, it was very difficult for me to write because I occasionally have a hard time controlling my tongue, but usually I don't. I have other things that I really, really, really struggle with. But more often than not, I have a hard time opening my mouth when I should. And so it's hard for me to give this kind of a message because I don't want you guys to think that I'm sitting here saying you all have a problem. Um, I mean, as a pastor, it's your job to kind of, it's not my job to make you grow. You People used to say this, if I've done my job, you'll change. That's not true. It's the Holy Spirit that changes you, not my sermon. That's just the way of it. But as a pastor, it is still your job to preach the word, all of the word, not just the parts that you want to preach. And so this whole series is one that I did not really want to preach because it sounds kind of harsh. I'm not really into that kind of stuff. I like more of, you know, helping you to f love God more in your heart. Well, unfortunately, God didn't really ask for my opinion on this series. And so here we are. Uh, so it, the question becomes, what if I serve and gossip? Is there such a way where I can serve God and not control my tongue? I mean, I do lots of things in ministry, and I've never had to control my tongue before. Here's the thing. Two answers to that. The first off, if you don't learn how to control your tongue, eventually you will not serve people. Sin has a way of degrading. It, it starts out perfectly fine, but it develops, right? So, like, let's say I have a bad attitude towards Vicky. She has earned my ire. Okay. Well, if I don't get that attitude under check, it's eventually going to spread to Robert. And then it's going to spread to whoever's friends with them. And then it's just going to spread to people in general where I'm just kind of bitter and nasty. That's how sin works. It spreads in us. And so when you serve people and you're gossiping, the first thing is eventually you won't. And I'm going to say something that I want you guys to remember. Write it down if you have to, but please try and remember this. If you don't learn how to control your tongue, eventually your ministry will, deg will degrade. Yeah, I said that right. Your ministry will, will, will degrade. It will get to the point where you'll be doing ministry without serving, where you're doing the thing, and you're going to say, look, I'm serving in ministry, but you're not actually serving in ministry. You're doing a thing, but without serving. And it's very easy to get to this place as a Christian, especially if you've been saved for longer than five to ten years. So I'm talking more to the older Christians here. If you've been saved less than that, it can happen, but usually not. If you've been saved for longer than five to ten years, this is going to be a struggle that you have where you do serving, you do, you do ministry without the right heart. Pastors do this too. We forget to have our own devotional time for ourselves, and it gets to be a thing where we're just up here trying to do something or trying to preach at people or trying to say, talk about something that annoys us. See what I mean? Rather than giving the word of God. 
It's something every Christian struggles with. Weigh your heart. Every couple of weeks, weigh your heart and say, am I doing without serving? Am I doing without serving? And the second, uh, the, second, uh, the second thing about if you keep trying to serve and gossip at the same time is it, it, whatever you do will be invalidated by your gossip. Attitude will always trump your action. Like when I was cleaning but complaining. When you volunteer but complain. Satan, I know, isn't oftentimes talked about in this context, but it's extremely important uh, I was reading a book that actually really uh, made me think about it. It was by John Eldridge, and I normally don't like, um, he gets a little bit into mystical things, and I normally don't really get it too much, but he wrote a book called, <clears throat> I don't know if I'll remember. Oh, I can't remember. I can see the cover. It wasn't Wild at Heart. It was the other one. Um, do you remember? No. Hmm, that's going to be... Anyways, let's move on. And in this book, he was talking about the way that Satan is actively fighting you in your life. So let's take that same concept and kind of apply it to this. Satan is actively working to destroy the church. He is actively working today to try to get us self-centered. Don't ever mistake the idea that just because God is working doesn't mean that Satan is taking a, a sick day. Satan is here in our services he wants you to take offense at the things that are said, the things that are, that are done. He wants to give you a spirit of offense. He wants you to go from offense to offense thinking, this person's wrong me and this person's wrong me. Because as long as he can keep you focused on the problems, you'll never notice how good God is. And God is good. God is so good. God's goodness is overwhelming if you just stop for a second and think about it. God just has a way of reaching you where you're at. God just has a way of, of working it out. I don't know what you're going through, but God will work it out. You, you might have to go through some junk, but God will work it out. He will. But Satan is very much so obviously and, and intentionally working to destroy the church. He wants us to be a self-centered church. And when we gossip and, and, and slander and, and that kind of stuff, we are being Satan's tool. That he's able to destroy the church with our mouth. Bitterness and, and, and cursing is coming from something that should be a fresh, a fresh spring. So to that, James 1.27 has a very, very clear and intentional message to us. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Stay on goal. Stay on track. We are here as a church to reach the lost. We are not here to gather the saints in. You know what I'm saying? Because some churches, they, they make it their mission to just try to gather the faithful. And here's the problem with that. Because we're not in competition with other churches. We're not trying to steal people from other churches. I don't... I, I, the thing that I want to see is I want to see you get involved in a church. Y your spirit needs that. We're not here to, to put on such a good show that people who are already sold on Jesus will be attracted to come here. We're, our goal here is to reach the lost. What did Jesus say when he was here? Remember, we're supposed to be about the master's business. So what did Jesus say when he was here? I came to free the captives, not to find people who are already free. What is the church's goal? To free the captives. We're not trying to gather the saints. We're trying to reach the lost. What's the difference? The difference is gathering the saints keeps me focused here. All my, all my focus is on the budget. And let me tell you, I, I, I do worry about the church's budget. I do do that. That's something I struggle with. I don't trust God like I should with the church's finances. That's, that's, that's one of my faults. Um, when, when, when we get self-focused, we think about, okay, well, I don't want to offend this person. I don't want to offend this person. Rather than what do we need to do to reach even one? See, it's an inward focus instead of an outward focus. It's a complete shift. And we're going too long, so we need to wrap stuff up. Uh, 
a good example of this is um, we don't have a kids' church, and we likely probably never will. The, the question that I've been asked numerous times, and so I'll just talk about it right now, the reason why we do not is because for two reasons. First off, we cannot compete with bigger churches. Waymaker has a fantastic system for how they do kids' church. Top notch. I've seen it myself. It's fantastic. Joel has a good head on his shoulders. I don't know what Grace does. I haven't ever been there. I haven't ever seen. But bigger churches are going to do, thing, do things like that better than us. We're a small church, and that's okay. We're not in competition with them. So rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, our goal here at this church is to encourage family togetherness. We want the family sitting together. We want them doing church together. We want them doing religious, religion together and doing faith together. That's what we want. See what I mean? So that's why we don't do it. There's lots of other bigger churches, and if they want something that does the big church thing, they'll go to a big church. Make sense? So you might think, and this is the last thing we need to really go over in this message, we, we might, you might fall into the, into the trap of thinking some, something along the lines of this. You, you just need to get it out. You need to just vent. You need to get it off your shoulders. It, it needs to be said. I'm just blowing off steam. There's three problems with that. The first off is when you allow yourself to do that kind of stuff, really what you're doing is first off you're allowing Satan to kill your spirit and get you farther from God. You're allowing Satan to do a work in your life and in the church. That's not good. Second thing, what you're, what you're really doing is you're stopping yourself from being used by God. You are stopping yourself from being used by God. You can either have an uncontrolled tongue or you can have pure religion. And the third thing that you're doing you're refusing the blessings of God. You are literally putting a stop to the blessings of God in your life. And the, and the fourth thing that I want to mention is you are preventing prayers from getting answered. When you let sin like that in your life, God will literally stop listening to your prayers. He will stop listening to your prayers. A good example of this is if you mistreat your spouse. And so now for, the, for people who maybe you don't, struggle with that. But I don't, I don't do that. Okay, all right. Maybe you, maybe you do have control over your tongue. And I wanted to give you something else so if you don't have that problem. Um, personal holiness is insufficient. Personal holiness is insufficient. We are called to love. It wasn't good enough for us, was it, that Jesus was holy and he was holy. He came down to us and died in our place so that we could be made right with God. If you started at the beginning of the thing, that would have been good. It's good to know that our God is, is holy, but it's insufficient for us, isn't it? He was holy from the get-go, but we couldn't reach him. But when he made a way, now we could reach him because he made a way. So next week, we're going to conclude this very difficult series <laughs> uh, by talking about the righteous live by faith. And... Um, just some of the ways that, that things are different from our culture than in the church and, and how we can make sense of that with God. If you'll join me in prayer. Lord, I, uh, I pray you put a guard over our lips, uh, put a guard over our, our fingers as we're online, uh, but, a, but a guard over our lips when we're talking to people or that we wouldn't be talking about people. Um, God, uh, your word says that you've, put a guard over our lips that we might not sin, and that's what we're asking, God. That we wouldn't sin against your holy and perfect name by the things that are coming out of our mouth. That the things that come out of our mouth would be sweet as the things that come out of your mouth. That it would be like a, a sweet fragrance. Um, like it would, be, it would be like creamer and sugar and coffee. They would just take the bitterness in it and, and, and make it sweet. Lord, I pray that you'd move us in compassion as, as, you're, as you're putting a, a guard over our fingers and that we wouldn't type stupid things and our mouths so we wouldn't say stupid things, that you'd also move us in compassion, that we'd reach out to our hurting community and, and, and see them pass their sin, see them pass the things that irritate them. And uh, God, that you would just give us a heart of compassion, that we'd be here to serve and love. And we thank you, God. We thank you for the opportunity to hear from you, for the opportunity to seek after you, and for the opportunity to serve Roswell and to be there for a hurting culture. We love you, God. In all things, we love you. And I pray, Lord, that your presence would go with these 
as they go throughout their, their week, that you would bless them and guide them, that you'd bring them to victory and raise them up in strength, that their sleep would be sweet and that their days would be filled with direction and purpose. Lord, that you would speak in their hearts and speak in their souls and guide them, Lord. Let their, let their words be a constant ministry to those around them. And everything that they say, Lord, bless them and keep them. Lord, I pray that you turn your face towards them to bless them and not, not for cursing. That you bless them and their household and their children after them, Lord. You'd be a, uh, you'd be a, a sweet fragrance in their life, Lord, and you'd be a wall about them. That you'd be a tower that lifts them up. Lord, bless them and keep them, and we love you, Lord. Amen. Have a good rest of your day.